And uh, so the heart and soul of our vision is really summarized in that story. We want to be a vibrant local church where we can know each other, uh, where the ordinary means of grace take precedence uh, over everything else, uh, where uh, we preach the Bible, uh, where we sing the Bible, we pray the Bible, uh, where we have uh, uh, self-grown leadership, self-grown missionaries, uh, self-grown vision, and uh, our, our, our hope and our prayer is that God would use us to change our culture, uh, to, to, to win souls to Christ, and to transform the structure of society while we're nurturing our families and raising our children in the godly fear of the Most High God. Uh, our worship is, uh, is deliberately liturgical, but our services are deliberately informal. I hope you've been able to notice that, that there is a personalness, that despite the fact that we have this structure, we try really hard to not allow it to be sort of dead orthodoxy, but a living expression of joy. Uh, we have been blessed with extraordinary musicians. It's central to our vision uh, that the gospel be portrayed beautifully uh, in light of the beauty of God's holiness. And so uh, when we first planted, we had the extraordinary uh, the musician and composer Greg Wilbur, who was uh, our, our, my partner in planting. Uh, and then uh, he, uh, Greg, decided that he was going to go with the church plant downtown, uh, and he recruited Nathan Clark George, his uh, brother, uh, to be our musician. And I was a little doubtful at first, but he won me over pretty quick. And, uh, but uh, along the way, uh, Henry Hafner, who was a student of mine from the sixth grade on, seventh grade on, uh, had uh, wandered afar, uh, gathered for himself degrees from Vanderbilt and uh, the University of Cincinnati, and uh, was uh, playing uh, viola for symphonies around the South, uh, and uh, the Lord brought him uh, back here, and uh, for a while he played with Nathan, uh, but his leadership and his gifts and his calling were really evident uh, right from the start, and when Nathan was called to North Carolina, it was easy to see the transition to Henry, and this is not just sort of an add-on for us. Uh, for, for us, I hope you notice uh, that the, the sermon is not the main event in our worship service. Uh, this, this worship service is uh, attempted, uh, we attempt to make it uh, an integrated whole so that every part of the service, every scripture we read, every response that we have, every hymn that we sing, uh, and the sermon, they all say the same thing. They all say one thing. And uh, so we're really grateful for the fact that we've been given uh, that great gift. Uh, theologically, we're part of the tradition of the Reformation. Uh, and in particular, that part of the Reformation that is uh, best known uh, by the Scottish Covenanters, the English Puritans, and uh, the Continental Calvinists. Uh, we believe in the doctrines of grace. Uh, we believe in the application of those doctrines to every single sphere of life. We have these tremendous theological uh, uh, declarations that we attempt to abide by. The Westminster Confession of Faith, the Shorter Catechism, uh, the Larger Catechism. Uh, and we're a part of the Evangelical Presbyterian denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America, uh, which is the largest Evangelical Presbyterian denomination uh, in the US. So that's kind of the, the, the quick overview 
of, of who we are, uh, I really love the interaction of questions and answers. And so uh, a fuller picture is probably going to come out as you ask your questions and as Tom fills in with his 153. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm just going to throw it open for questions. What, uh, what questions do you but we do some peculiar things. So if, uh, if you want to ask about the peculiar things, like why don't we take up an offering, and uh, if you come from a liturgical tradition, you might have noticed our confession of sin comes after uh, the preaching rather than before, which is um, somewhat unusual in the Reformed world. So any question? It can be theological. It can be practical. Yes? Books when you preach. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so cool. <laughs> Tell me more about that. <laughs> well, yeah, I actually um, came under the conviction after watching a friend of mine, a really dear friend of mine, uh, preach from an iPad. Um, and I, I realized, you know, I want people to know that these quotes come from actual books. Not, not off the internet. I didn't go Google search uh, and try and find this quote. That this is a part of the life of the mind that uh, their pastor is, you know, wrestling with this text in substantive ways. Uh, the other thing that I try and do is vary it. So, I mean, I've got kind of my go-tos, but I, I try and make sure that I'm sampling multiple centuries and multiple streams of the faith because what we're attempting to do is, um, is, is show the universality of the Christian faith. So the reason I, when, when I quote, I quote it right out of the book is I want you to know these are real books and I want you to go and buy the real books and I want you to read the real books. And, I want books to be a part of your life. I, I'm not a, a technophobe, and I'm not a Luddite, uh, but I do believe that there is a, a, a kind of a power in the printed page. That, that is a great question. Elders, did you hear that? We need a building. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have plans for a church library. We, uh, we barely have enough room to uh, make our way to the transgender bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Missionaries on the field. We have 
uh, missionaries in uh, Colombia, in Iraq, uh, and uh, we have had missionaries scattered all over the world. So very, very much part of our mission and vision. Yes? Uh, the name of the church, I assume, one is the model of parish and commerce. Is there more to, to the name, or was that the reason for the children's name? Yeah, that's the reason for the name. Actually, we kind of got herded into the name. I, I wanted it to be uh, something like, you know, something like Westminster Presbyterian Church a parish uh, or a Franklin parish or something like that. But the guy who um, who went out and got our domain name uh, for our website simply put Parish Presbyterian Church. And all of the elders, when they saw it, said, yeah, that, 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 that's it. And that, that says mission and vision and everything else are right there in the name. So I was a little <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Uh, no, we, we don't take up an offering uh, because we have visitors. Uh, we believe that uh, tithes and offerings are a part of the worship of the body of Christ. Uh, and we believe that it is a commitment that uh, members of the local church should make. That it's a solemn responsibility. It's a, a, a glorious privilege. Uh, but we don't want to create it. Uh, and so uh, what we have done is we've made a box available and uh, we, you know, if somebody is here who's not a believer, uh, they're, they're, they're not having to face, you know, money being passed under their nose. It's uh, partially evangelistic, partially sensitivity to our visitors, partially it's a reaction to the money sort of mindset of the modern evangelical church. And it's partially a call for us uh, to worship quietly in a spirit of, of humility. Yeah, Na? So I've been here since the first meeting. So I can't, because my house is the closest to this on the other side, and it's easier to drive this instead of going downtown Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why we're here. Um, but I would just give you my take on that because I grew up being a plate, you know, uh, people passing the plate with me. But in the past, since we started, I think George taught, taught me well this one is we don't overreact when we are the, the down day, the down days, or the up years, or down years, however you want to call it. But the Lord has always provided for us, He has been gracious and abundant. Uh, and George has been, and the staff has been very gracious in the down years. And when the up years, we reward them for their sacrifice. The Lord has been gracious. And I had an old pastor tell me, test God. Just test God. Be faithful in giving and test Him. So. Amen. Amen. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Almost everything we do is pretty deliberate. Uh, so, uh, it, it, anything from where I stand uh, when I do different things in the, in the service, you'll notice, uh, except for in the live stream, in the 10 o'clock service, uh, when I read the Bible, I'm always over on that side. That's deliberate. Uh, when we have a building, we'll actually have two podiums uh, so that we can read the scriptures uh, from one and preach from the other. Uh, w where we have the elements of the service, it's all very deliberate. Uh, Henry works really hard with Emma in picking out hymns that are, are you know, very, very purposeful. So we, I, I'm sure there's stuff that we do that's just habit or accidental, but we try to examine everything and do everything as deliberately as possible. Yes? It wasn't beautiful like this. Uh, the, uh, the idea behind the fireplace was uh, to try and replicate uh, Francis Schaeffer's uh, hearth at Labrie in Weymouth, Switzerland. Uh, one of my mentors and heroes, and uh, but but also to 
convey, we, it, it was, it's a non-functional fireplace, so we could have just walled it up. But the reason that we left it is that we're, we're gathering around God's heart uh, as we come before the throne to worship. And uh, so it, it, part of it is to make uh, what could be just a little box a little less <coughs> that. Uh, part of it is indigenous. You know, it looks like Tennessee stone. Uh, and, you know, same, same reason that we have the style of music that we do. It's indigenous. It sounds like Franklin. So, yeah. So all, all of that kind of uh, together. Uh, the reason I stand off to the side uh, is uh, traditionally uh, the, uh, the reading of God's word uh, is... Uh, to the right of the people or to the left hand of God. Uh, so it's a theological thing developed early, early on in the, in the church. So the preaching of the word is at the right hand of God, the reading of God's word is at the left hand of God. Yes? I was wondering if you could just trace for us uh, the contour. Is it 
That's that's a great question. We, when we ordain our deacons and elders, we uh, if we have deacons and elders to be ordained, they're all ordained together. There are separate vows for deacons uh, and elders, uh, but uh, and it's done as a worship service. Um, so the, the other stuff that we would ordinarily do in the in the worship service is uh, greatly abridged in order for us to make that a center point of the worship service. About the deacons and the elders. How do you see this is just number one. <laughs> this is number one. Wait. <laughs> 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 pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all kind of like that. <laughs> but the deacons and elders, it's always been interesting. How, how does the church look at the role, the difference between a deacon and an elder? Because when you go into Timothy and Titus, I mean, you got a lot of qualifications. I was just about to say, all the way going down. Right. How, how do we see it? How does the church look? See, and I'm new to the Presbyterian. Yeah. I mean, I'm Christian Missionary Alliance for 45 years, and uh, it seems to interest me to see how the role is. Because you have a lot of deacons and a lot of elders. Yes. You know, I don't know how big the church is, but when I first started looking at the back, I'm going, wow. You know. Well, yeah, L let me address that first. Uh, we, we actually don't have enough deacons and elders uh, because. <clears throat> Our deacons and elders are the front lines of ministry. They are the ones who are hosting the home fellowship groups, doing the discipleship meetings, uh, gathering with uh, uh, widows that are struggling with their finances, uh, walking with young people who are just trying to figure out their way and their calling. They're the ones who do all of that. Uh, in, the, in the New Testament, what, one of the things that we see, beginning in Acts chapter 6, uh, is that deacons had the responsibility for a lot of the practical details of the operation of the local church. So the deacons are responsible to basically run the stuff of the church. Uh, they're the ones who make the committees work. They're the ones who make sure that the building is uh, heated and lit and uh, that at least most of the parking lot is flat. <laughs> uh, they're the ones who, I mean, they were the, our deacons were here until 11 o'clock last night, uh, making sure that the, the parking lot was plowed and, uh, and, and not in the sleep. <laughs> Worried about our parking lot. So, so they take care of the practical affairs. They're the ones who deal with the money. Um, you know, they are the ones who uh, formulate the budget. So that's all deacons. Uh, elders are responsible primarily for the ministry of the word and prayer. And it's the elders who set the mission and the vision of the church uh, that will be executed by primarily our deacons. Uh, but they're also the, <clears throat> they, they are the pastors. They pastor the book. Now we have hired staff members who help give direction to them uh, and who are responsible to guide and disciple them. But um, the, the, it's the elders who rule the church, and it's the elders uh, who, in, in the end, pastor the church. Uh, yes, Trinity. Um, you said the deacons are in charge of the money, I guess is how you might put it. Um, so when it comes to financial accountability, so yeah, who has access to it, and who's you know, do you offer it up for review with different you know, third-party outsiders yeah, that's a great question. Now you want to answer that? So we had a deacon who took a, a better job, so he decided to move on, and he gave me, <laughs> <laughs> he gave, he gave me a responsibility to be in charge of the deacons. Uh, I hopefully not too long. I need somebody else. But uh, <laughs> uh, so we have a uh, financial com uh, finance committee uh, headed by a deacon, but an elder who really uh, uh, oversees that, and that. Uh, committee reports to uh, the elders. That's the internal uh, coverage part. And uh, our, our administrator, she does a good job of the bookkeeping side of it, she does reports, but also we have a third party LBMC that does the auditing, the accounting part for us, and we need the expertise side, because we, we're not accountants. You know, some people are, but we're not. So that end of it, the accountability comes into play. They, we, when we need an audit, they'll they can come to, they did our book audit. I mean, that's a great thing for them to do for us. And the reporting to the elders, any reporting they need, historical reporting, 
but in terms of the actual send the budget, the deacons submit to the elders to see any any loopholes, because we need you know wisdom and you know and then um, and executing it, deacons you know we're just making sure everybody is being paid, invoicing, and then the administrator takes care of that particular you know she, you know in terms of signing, the, none of the deacons sign really the need to because there's a lot of accountability in a lot of hands and the elders are actually. In terms of anything large signing, is the elders in terms of but not the pastors. Not the pastors. the pastors. No. The pastors no. never see the money. Yeah. Pastors never see the giving. Pastors can't sign. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think they have trusted you with a credit card for the bookstore. Well, I, I, I still get the priesthood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even in, even in terms of reimbursement for, for the. From the deacon's perspective, we always have another deacon involved submitted to even the administrator. Just, we want to be above board. We are, in, it's open book. You can come ask us for our books. It's not, and that's, you know, the Lord's money, not our money. Yeah. You know, that's really the, the key. Yes, yeah, so is there a budget that we, people coming to the church, can see? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Um, all you have to do is ask for we'll print one. I'm asking. <laughs> Tom wants to copy the budget. All right. All right, uh, thinking about the role of, of the elders uh, as opposed to deacons, and tell us a little bit about sort of the role of the teaching elder as a pastor and the role of the ruling elder. Kind of just drill down into that, how that's fleshed out in body life. That, that's a complicated question. In the PCA, we say that we are a two office church. But we actually have this sort of, uh, in one of the offices, we have Elder A and Elder B, and it's kind of weird. Uh, a teaching elder in the PCA, really across the Reformed world, uh, there is a desire for an educated clergy. Uh, and uh, the result is there are, there are rigorous requirements, for, right now? Yes, sir. <laughs> rigorous requirements in order to go to seminary, uh, to learn that Hebrew grammar. How's Jonah chapter 2? I haven't got there yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's working on Jonah right now in Hebrew, and uh, let me tell you, it's, uh, it's quite the puzzle. So, so in the Presbyterian world, in the Reformed world, we believe in an educated clergy. Uh, but we also believe that the teaching elders, that, that educated clergy, they, they need men around them that uh, carry out the work of the ministry. So I see my job primarily as preaching the word, guiding the worship, um, pulling together the staff, and encouraging and discipling our elders to then do the work of the ministry. Yes, I do counseling. Yes, I meet with folks uh, from time to time at, at coffee shops. You and I have met at coffee shops. Um, <clears throat> that my, my primary job is to, to study all week long to be able to open the Word of God in a responsible way. Uh, and then to guide the worship. That, that's my primary job. So a teaching elder has that you know, weight of responsibility. I have help. I have great help. You know, Brian is amazing. Uh, Brian is an incredible gift in the area of pastoral care. Uh, Brian will do anything that he is asked to do. It's extraordinary. He's got a servant's heart. He's, uh, he's very gifted in the opening of the word of God. But his greatest gift is he just loves you all. And he pours himself out for you. Um, Jamie is going to be an incredible church manager. And I can't wait to see what happens with them once he gets past Jonah chapter 2. <laughs> <coughs> Does that help? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yes. How do you go about uh, You baptize babies? We do baptize babies. How's it going? All right, so because I grew up. Yeah. Um, well, this is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, yeah, I grew up totally in yeah. another world.
Uh, most of us probably grew up in Baptistic circles. And uh, most of us, I mean, the, the Baptistification of American culture uh, from the middle of the 19th century all the way up to the end of the 20th century was, you know, pretty comprehensive. But one of the things that, that we see in the scriptures that is never really adequately answered is what is the covenant? The covenant that is God's commitment to a peculiar people to raise up generations. If you don't have a strong theology of the covenant, then it's really difficult to understand how cultures can be changed. It's really difficult to understand why the education of our children is so vitally important, not just for their minds, but for their hearts, to cause them to love what they're supposed to love rather than simply obey what they're supposed to obey. So the covenant is this really critical thing. And over and over and over again, we see in the scriptures that children are brought into the covenant through the solemn vows of their parents. So that in the same way that we're redeemed, often against our will, like the Apostle Paul knocked off his high horse on his way to uh, Damascus, uh, it's a work of God's sovereign grace, uh, the result of no work of our own. Uh, we believe that in baptism, uh, what we have is this really beautiful biblical model of parents saying, yes, Lord, we will. Yes, Lord, we believe. Yes, Lord, uh, we're going to walk in your way and raise up this child to love you all the days of their life. And we want to be marked by it. The, uh, every time we do uh, baptism here, we have a Bible study that is on the back side of the vows that mm -hmm. kind of walks through all of the scriptures about baptism. Uh, it's, it's really kind of eye-opening when you start to realize that the words that are used uh, for baptism, uh, the, the instances of actual baptisms, are, are almost always household baptisms. So yeah, it's a thing. Good. <laughs> yeah. So we've been uh, here on Sunday morning, but you know, we have we have four boys, ten, eight, six, and two. Yes. Right? And they're incredible. Um, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. I know them. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. <laughs> and, <laughs> so it's really important for us to like have them mentored and trained. I don't like it the most, but <laughs> how does the church? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, obviously, we, we believe that worship itself is the primary place from which all other ministries flow. So it all starts with worship. Uh, as uh, our children see us worship, as our grandchildren see us worship, they are drawn to Christ. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, we, we obviously, uh, you might want to speak to one of the elders about this, we obviously need a building. Uh, because <laughs> we're very limited in classroom space. <clears throat> but we do our very best. In non-COVID times, uh, we've had a pretty robust uh, Sunday school program. Uh, we also have youth ministry. We also have home fellowship groups. And the home fellowship groups are a great place where families uh, in, in the light stages of life gather together and kids get to know each other and, and all of the rest. So we take all of that really, really seriously. But um, in one of the very first inquirers uh, meetings that we had at church, somebody asked me, uh, what I believed about youth ministry. I said, I strongly believe in youth ministry. It's called parents. <laughs> we, we believe that uh, our job is to make available lots and lots of opportunities for all of our children to grow in grace. Uh, one, one of the things, for instance, that we have is uh, we believe in Christian education, and we uh, try really hard to encourage uh, families to homeschool or uh, to 
to send their children to uh, Christian schools. And we know that this is not easy for a lot of families. And so we actually make money available. Uh, we have scholarship funds so that families who are struggling uh, can be able to afford it. So all of those things sort of work together. Uh, but our vision is <coughs> generational. We want our children to love Jesus. And we want them to grow uh, to, uh, to be, you know, giants of the faith. Huh? I, I want to say two things that I really appreciate for the church. Um, the uh, one is the, the Sunday school. I love Sunday school because I love teaching it. Uh, I miss it a lot. Um, so I've started in kindergarten all the way up to the fourth and up to sixth grade. Uh, I like sports in sixth grade. They can talk back to me. The other ones <laughs> already talk. But it's been a really passion of mine to enjoy doing it. And I hate every time that the parent wants to take over because I'm like, ah. Because another Deacon and I really enjoy teaching together, you know. But uh, but I let the parents do it, you know. They, 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 but I really love to teach Sunday school because I see it to my children because my children are in it. But I, you know, uh, it, that's one thing I really love because let they Matt, are you still on the educational committee? Uh, and you know, Matt asks every year, are you, are you on? I said until I said no, Matt, just keep me on. Quit asking. Uh, but uh, it's really a big part of it, seeing a couple of parents involved, uh, especially couples together. That's great to see that, or two women, and, or, or two deacons, because you know, the deacons can involve too. We, we substitute a lot, the deacons will come involved, be part of it, and really allowing the deacons to be involved, which I'm really thankful for Matt to have, because that's how, how we want to raise, and that's how I want to raise the next deacon, is to be one, to, to, to the boys here, you know, it's, that's how I was raised, when a deacon walk me through life, and I want to be deacon from it ever since on. Uh, then the next one is home fellowship group. It's an, been an amazing time for us. We came here with two children, and we thought we had more children in order to get plugged in. So we went to this uh, home fellowship group that grew up to be 60, and there were half children. And we couldn't do a Bible study. We had tried, but we fellowshiped. We grew together to a point where they asked, hey, you want to make your own? Because we were getting crowded. So we made our own. <laughs> And we grew that, and we, then we grew again, let people take over, and that's the multiplication of that home fellowship. It's just a, a beautiful part of our church that I think um, I really miss because of COVID, you know, all that stuff, but it's really a, a distinctive that I think we have here in our church. Some of our home fellowship groups are back meeting now, and uh, really grateful for that, and uh, we're, we're ramping back up uh, virtually all of We've got uh, Lenten time dinners coming up on Wednesday nights and choir, and it's pretty exciting to, to see. Um, normal is my new favorite word. <laughs> Other questions? I, I have a hard word. Evangelism? Yes. How does the church approach it? I mean, obviously, we should all be doing it. Right. But with your guidance, with the elders' guidance, how, how do we look at that so we can evangelize, frankly? Yeah. And read some county and, and, and so on and so on. Amen. Would we, we do have a heart for evangelism. I would say that uh, none of us do it well. I think uh, we've got way too much American in us. Uh, and uh, the result is we're not as effective in evangelism as we ought to be. Uh, we have taught. Evangelism Explosion, uh, which is a, a, a fine uh, evangelism uh, approach. Uh, but teaching evangelism is way different than doing uh, evangelism. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we have attempted to do is uh, get our congregation involved in some things like uh, foster care uh, programs, uh, here in the state of Tennessee uh, with uh, Tennessee Children's Homes, which give us an opportunity to share the faith in a context uh, that, that is uh, beautiful. Uh, we have volunteers that go to Grace Works at Christmas time. Uh, every person who comes to Grace Works to shop for their family uh, or to get groceries uh, gets to hear the Christmas story. And so uh, one, one of the things that's really, really good to 
sort of jumpstart our heart for evangelism is to sit with a family that has great needs and share with them the simple story of Christmas. Uh, that enables us to then uh, see our calling to evangelize wherever we go. Uh, another thing that we have done in the past that <clears throat> you might want to tell one of the elders that we need a building, but... Uh, yeah, that was my next question. So, <laughs> the, uh, uh, when we were downtown, we had uh, English as a second language classes that was opened up to the public. What an incredible opportunity for evangelism. It's just absolutely incredible. And so uh, we, we hope to be able to restart that again. Uh, again, our, our facilities aren't adequate here, but uh, English as a second language is a great, great avenue for um, reaching our neighborhood. Yes, we, we had uh, we have Japanese, we have Chinese, and then we we have just sort of the generic uh, ESL classes in which we had uh, where did Karen go? <laughs> she left me. <laughs> I, I I can't remember. I think at one point we had uh, had uh, seventeen different languages, uh, and it was it was really beautiful. Uh, we had. Uh, a woman from Ukraine, we had multiple Chinese, a couple Japanese, uh, many, many Spanish speakers uh, from all over Central America and South America, uh, Peru, Honduras, and it was, it was really good. Thank you. And what about Billy? Yeah. <laughs> Should we ask an elder? Uh, yeah. Uh, let me ask an elder. <laughs> Mike, give us an update. Right now, 
were really almost three separate congregations. You know, pe people don't see each other. We just don't know each other. So we'd like to be able to worship in one space. Uh, that's one consideration. But the biggest consideration is we really need classroom space so that we can uh, do the kinds of discipleship, things like English as a second language, outreach to the community. Uh, one of the things that has been the philosophy of parish from the beginning is that our, our default answer, when somebody says, can we use the building, our default answer is yes. We want this facility to be used, and it constantly is. Um, and uh, we want to be a blessing to the community. Well, right now, it's just really limited what this facility can, uh, can enable us to do. So a couple of things that we'll have is we're, we're going to have an uh, I, th I think we're going to shoot for an outdoor wedding chapel uh, so that we have a little amphitheater so we can have concerts and we can have uh, weddings outdoors uh, and then a very, very utilitarian, multi-purpose building, but beautiful, uh, that will be our, um, our, our unified worship space uh, with some classrooms. Uh, obviously, we've got this building too, which we uh, will uh, perhaps modify but once we have that building so that we have, you know, the opportunity to do a lot more ministry. So let, let me ask Anne a little bit. Um, also helping Mike on the building commission. Uh, so want to pray for, pray for our elders on it. They have a, a heavy burden to think through a lot of decisions. Uh, so that I, I've really been really been you know pressed upon me to really pray for them because it's you know I, I'm one of the deacons on the building and I don't mind doing the legwork but I don't have a burden like they have because they have a burden I, I just I can just call people I can go to Franklin City Hall I can do all that that's easy for me just show up but they have to decide is this the right time is this the you know all kinds of other things financially is it sound is all that stuff so that's one thing I want people to, to be thinking about. Second is, just giving a pre-COVID, we have shoved almost 200 people in one room, a service. I've been here sitting. I've been shoving people there. I've been shoving people there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm was waiting. Three Sundays ago, we had, yeah. we had about eight people in the kitchen. kitchen. Uh, yeah. Because we didn't have room in the lobby. So, so really... I pray for the fire marshal not show up at all. <laughs> he might be a Christian. I don't want him to come close. <laughs> but it's that level of, I mean, we probably have maxed every holiday service. With the two services we do, we were, we were aiming for three at one time for Christmas Eve. Yeah. So, because we knew how full it would be. So that's really the big driving force is for us, you know, it's just, having one place together, but knowing each other's name. The only time I know another person, another service, I, I'm helping the, during the, you know, the lead deacon time when I'm here serving. Other than that, I had to relearn, relearn a lot of people's names every Sunday. You realize we've never been able to do advertising? We've never been able to just say, come, because there's no room. <laughs> no room in the end. So... Yeah, so that's that's uh, it is. And in Sunday school is crazy. And you, there's a wa there's a water heater, and I shoved twenty people in there. Okay. <laughs> it's not in the water heater. <laughs> it's in the room with the it, water it feels heater. like it, but it, it's great. But at the same time, you can feel it, especially that room where you know he doesn't have an office hardly. He has a closet for office. You know, that's the kind of things that he's he's sacrificing for us to to have Sunday school. All right, one last question, Solomon. With your desire not to be a mega church, right? And, and like, how do you protect yourself? Or how do you steward the, the, the body here to, to kind of go with and along with what you felt called to? Well, number one, we plant churches, and we cast the vision for church planting. Uh, we sacrifice uh, to, to send our guys off to seminary to get them ready to bring them back to send them out to, to plant churches. Um, we are constantly thinking about succession planning. And so that's, that's an essential part of it. And uh, part of that is, 
It is just to grasp uh, the great vision of the New Testament. You don't see the Apostle Paul saying, okay, we need a mega church in Ephesus and a mega church in Corinth uh, because those are strategic uh, mercantile locations. No, no, no. He's planting churches everywhere. And that's, that's what we want to be a part of. All right. Well, this has been fun. I know that uh, I think, Tom, we only got the three. Oh, do we do four? Okay. Yeah. We did not there. But uh, we're always available for any, any questions. We will, on the Saturday following Easter, have a new members class. Uh, so if you would like to be a part of uh, Parish, if you'd like to join Parish, uh, you can be a part of that. And uh, we can talk about, uh, about joining. But you can also just go to any one of our elders and say, you know what, I'm, I'm new members class or not, I'm, I'm ready to initiate the process of church membership. What do I need to do? And the elders uh, will then walk you through the process. It's basically just to hear your testimony and uh, to you know, think a little bit about your gifts and your calling and then a, a way to engage you in the body. But uh, we, we would love uh, to see the Lord use you uh, in our midst to help us grow in grace and to become uh, the uh, force for Christ that God has called us to be in this uh, remarkable time. Uh, isn't it extraordinary that God has called us to this strategic moment? It's not an accident. Our God is son. Well, let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for these, my brothers and sisters, and I pray uh, that you would indeed grow us in grace and that you would uh, continue to uh, stir in us a vision for the kingdom. And Lord, uh, with John Knox who cried, Lord, give me Scotland or I die, uh, we cry out, Lord, give us Tennessee. Amen. Uh, give us Tennessee. And, and then, Lord, uh, we pray that in concentric circles, you would send gospel power out to the ends of the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name.